so I suppose we should get underway. Um, uh, Timothy uh, Bragi uh, offered to come out and give a, a quick introduction to Haskell, uh, going through kind of just like the basics of Haskell syntax. We've got a lot of new faces uh, this time around, um, and so we're trying to, to open it up and not have it all be academic. Uh, uh, it's my career, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, so, so Tim's going to do the first talk, and then later on, uh, Ryan Wisniewski was coming out and was going to do a talk on uh, um, the, his functional query language that he's been working on with uh, David Beck. Um, so that that will probably be around eight o'clock, so, and then we'll run until about nine. So, yeah. All right. So, can everyone hear me? Do I need to put the microphone on? The microphone's probably a good idea. I think it's a good idea. <coughs> All right, so um, I'm a Haskell beginner, uh, but I've been very interested in it, so I decided I'd write a little talk um, about uh, just a, an introductory talk to Haskell. This can be uh, interactive if everybody wants, you know, so you ask questions, whatever, as I'm going, that's fine. I'm going to try to cover a lot of stuff in a few slides, so um, hopefully it goes okay. Um, and uh, just to point out, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is taken. It follows very closely um, the learning of Haskell book. For those of you who are familiar with it, and um, I do borrow some code examples from there, so don't think that everything's original. So, so um, short motivation for why you know why, why you might want to learn how to use what, why you might want to learn about Haskell. Um, I think it's I think it's uh, you know even for you know Java developers like me, it's good to learn a, uh, a function, a purely functional language. I think it gives you a different perspective on things. There's a lot of interesting features in Haskell. Um, you know, sort of forces you into this uh, um, functional mindset. You can't really cheat like you can in Scala, for example. Um, there's lazy, there's type inference, you know, there's a lot of very interesting things about the language. But let's start um, with some syntax. So, it's not showing up right now. Yeah, turn off the first. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Can we kill um, the front line? They're probably over there. First, first, um, yeah. Yeah, just keep going on. Oh, all right. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so um, uh, Haskell has an interactive shell. Um, so I'm just going to start off by um, here's some code exam or some uh, little snippets, expression snippets inside of uh, GHCI. Uh, so, you know, for of course, you can do, you know, well, you can do a uh, map. Uh, so Haskell can do that. Um, you'll notice that uh, one of the things that I found um, sort of, yes? Alright. I'm going to have to do it in every slide, unfortunately. We'll see what happens. Alright, so um, one of the things that I found uh, sort of you know, unexpected was sort of the not equals is that's, you know, slash equals. So um, when you're using sort of uh, you know uh, symbolic uh, function names, they can be used in infix uh, form, form uh, in infix um, style, like I've shown here. Um, and some more examples, you know, um, a normal function takes the first element out of a tuple. Um, I, you know, first one, two, three, one. Um, Multi-argument function. So um, one different one thing about Haskell that's a little bit uh, sort of different than you know people coming from you know, Java or C or whatever is. Um, function application is actually the space, which is use space for function application. So a two-argument function, and that's imprecise, we'll talk about that later, uh, like min takes, uh, you know, you, you put the, two, the argument separated by spaces after the function name. So min 9, 10, um, returns 9. Again, um, I, did a, uh, I did 40 plus 2 again, because I wanted to show that. So numbers, um, numbers can sort of act like, uh, like the number 40 can act like either a floating point number or an integer, for example. 
So if you specify the type of 40, then uh, with the addition return, you know, you'll get that 40 or 41 value for you at the end. However, we are not using JavaScript, so you cannot add a double new function, all right? So, um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, even sort of alphanumeric functions can be used in index notation to be wrapped, to sort of wrap in even tick marks. That's what I've done here for sort of modular, um, modular division, all right? Moving forward, um, create your own functions. So if you wanted to create a single argument function to you know, sort of double the number, you know, double me, um, the name of the function's on the left, it takes a, uh, an argument, x, and you say x plus x, you mean double, double x. Um, you can do two arguments, I, you know, sort of very, un, very uninteresting function done right here. Um, one thing to note is uh, um, a posh, or I guess it's an apostrophe can be used in uh, sort of uh, function names oftentimes if uh, if you have a function that's very related to another one, they can use that for you know, a dog. prime mark. Prime, prime. Yeah, yeah. like half prime. Yeah. Like half. Right. Okay, so a few call functions with other functions. Um, the uh, everything in, in Haskell is an expression. So, like um, you know, unlike sort of in Java, for example, the if then else it's an if then else statement. Well, it's not a statement; it's an expression. So, so the result of that ex that thing is a value. So you. As the, the value, or as the uh, right hand side of the function, and then another example we're using, we're getting the number out and, and adding that to the function. Um, so lists are ubiquitous in functional programming. So uh, there's this notion of what's called a cons list. Uh, you'll often see them built up with a colon operator. So one colon two colon three colon the empty list is just the list one two three. Uh, the fast operations on this list are head and tail. Um, so this is a linked list data structure. Um, so you call head and tail, which are fast. You can also concatenate lists. Uh, strings are just lists of characters. And um, I mentioned earlier that Haskell is a lazy language, which means that you could have sort of infinite data, infinitely sized data structures. So uh, the function cycle, one cycle of a list, which is basically just repeating values out of that list uh, um, inf infinitely long, for an infinite amount of time. So you can take, so if, for example, you take 10, Elements out of that sort of infinitely sized list, you get a list of size 10. Um, and repeat similar, you get you know, five repeating infinitely, infinitely many times, and you take 10 values, or ten, take the first 10 elements out of that list. Um, so, don't look at the answer. So, there's a quiz. <laughs> so, we will not talk about that. So, How'd you get the third element out of a uh, list? Hopefully the answers won't be displayed on the next ones. All right, so uh, Haskell is a strongly typed language. Um, so we're going to start looking, we're going to take a little a brief look at its type system. All right, so um, within GHCI, you can get the type of any expression by doing uh, colon T. You know, so the type of, uh, you know, A is a character of, of uh, apostrophe, apostrophe is a character, you know, true is a boolean, hello is a list of uh, characters, like I said earlier, and you have tuples. Um, the type of uh, the four equals equals five is a boolean, right, this is a, you know, it's an expression, so um, the, the, the type of an expression is the result of that, it's the result of that expression, well, it's the result of that expression. Um, function types look a little differently, a little, a little different, so a "Quote unquote uh, single argument function here, double me take that we had seen earlier takes takes an int to an int. Um, if you had another you know, another function that maybe added three ints together, these are all very uninteresting functions, like I said. It's int to int to int to int. So um, that looks a little strange. Uh, we'll talk about that later. All right. So um, some sort of common core types, you know, int, integer, float, double, bool, character. You know, sort of the, the things you'd expect in a in a real language." Any questions so far? All right. So um, types uh, can have types. Types can have type variables. So, for example, the type of the head function on a list is a list of some type a to that type a. So, um, in this in this example, a is a uh, sort of unspecified type, just like you would just like you would see in sort of generics uh, in Java or C sharp or I guess templates in C plus plus. Um, the type of first is takes a tuple of type A and B and returns an A. 
So in this case, um, you know, A and B can be the same type, they can be different types. It doesn't matter. It's very long um, So now we have type classes. Um, type classes are sort of uh, our Haskell's way of doing uh, ad hoc polymorphism, I guess is the right word for that. Um, so the type of the equals function is um, this thing. So for anything that's a member of the equals type class, it takes two of those things and returns a boolean. Um, similarly, for greater than, you know, there's a there's an ordinal or, or an ORD type class, and there's an enum type class. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of these sort of core type classes in Haskell. I've listed a few of them here. Um, show is for um, converting uh, type, converting values of, of some types of strings. Reads for going the other way. I guess bounded is for sort of bounded. You know, should have a least and a greatest element. Least and the greatest element. Uh, Numbers, you know, generic number type, integral types, floating point types. There's, there's a lot of these. I guess there's like 50. So that's numbers. Oh my god. <coughs> so, <laughs> you guess what the type of plus is? And Ed can't answer. Right. Is there any bounds on the type though? Or no, exactly. So, so plus takes any two numbers um, and it takes them of the same type and um, and and produces a result of that of that same type. Um, all right. So, so how you build your own functions, sort of more interestingly. Yes. Wait, I'm just curious. What's the difference between the double equal arrow and the single equal arrow? Single arrow. Yes. So this. Okay. So this separates the. Uh, sort of, I don't know what you call it, the, the, the bounds or yeah, the constraints that the are constraints, like, those, like yeah. those are those are constraints that will be satisfied by the like the compiler will look around for such a type class. You explicitly pass everything on the right hand side of the double arrow, and the other stuff is plumbed around for you by the types. Yes. I think one way to think about number is that you know type classes is sort of like an interface in JavaScript, right? I mean, it's sort of like not really, but it's you know. Yeah, it doesn't really have a good analog in other languages. Yeah, it's really a, a fairly distinctive thing. All right, so how do you build your own functions? Um, so typically build functions by something called pattern matching. So in this case, I'm building a function that takes some integral uh, numeric type and produces a string. So if uh, so, now you can read. So read this first function, lucky, sort of as you know, is in three lines. So the first line is just the type, which is optional. You don't have to specify the type for most functions, although it's usually good practice to. Um, if you pass the first, if the argument for lucky is a seven, I'm going to return this lucky number seven string. If it's anything else, um, that thing, anything else gets bound to x in this case, and I could use x on the right hand side, I'm actually not in this case. Um, factorial, everybody knows how to write factorial function. Um, how you might do it in Haskell is factorial of zero and one, and then you can recursively call, you know, uh, you know, like most languages, Haskell allows you to recursively call a function from within a function, right? So factorial of n is n times factorial of n. Um, uh, and there's one thing to note, though. So um, you want to be careful. So first of all, I should say that the uh, sort of these, the order of your patterns match or matters. So you know, yeah, Haskell will look at the uh, sort of first pattern first and see if you match and goes down. So it does matter what order the pattern. Um, and you can think of like lucky x or factorial n sort of like a wild card pattern or a capture in a way. If that makes any sense. Um, so. Because of this, you want to be careful when you're building your functions. I mean, GHC will give you a warning, but if I wrote a silly function like this, um, and then I try to pass in h to it, you know, you get an exception, right? So you got to, you got to sort of like care, be, be careful to uh, um, be careful to capture all cases and possibly have an exception. Example, for example, you can do uh, you can do math, you can do pattern matching on lists. So again. One implementation of the head function might be um, to give me the empty list. I'm going to throw an error because I cannot produce a value of someone of constraint type. Um, we don't have nulls in Haskell. 
So, um, or if you give me a list that is of at least size one, I'm going to bind that first element to x. The underscore is sort of a wild card that you don't care about. So, um, so what we're doing is we're taking this in the second pattern. There, we're taking we're taking the list, binding the first element to x, and the rest of them we're just sort of like not binding. We're not naming them real, but it's but it has to be there. Yes. We don't have those, but we have something called the naming convention. We'll talk about naming. Don't worry. I love naming. Okay. So, um, so uh, we can also write a sum type. So let's say you had some. You know, wanted to write a, um, a function to uh, sum all the elements, in a, a numeric elements in the list, sum of the empty list is zero. Otherwise, you um, take apart the first first out, take the first element out of the recursively call sum against the, the tail of the rest of the list. All right. So one thing to note here is that cons or this colon um, constructor uh, only finds the list of at least one element. Um, so there's a lot going on in the slide. This example, unfortunately, I didn't notice that until right before the talk. But um, you can have these things called guards. So if I wanted to build a, I take a function that uh, takes two elements, um, you can first, in this where clause, you can, the where clause isn't necessary for the guards. So that's why I sort of mix it in. But um, uh, if you want to bind, uh, so, so I, let me back to that. I could have said, instead of area in all those cases, I could have said weight, you know, width, weight times height. Width times height, less than or equal to 12, is tiny, you know, blah, 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 blah. I just wanted to give a name to it, so that's computed in every version of the pattern, right? So you can sort of think of this as a big impulse block. Otherwise, or otherwise, it's sort of the sort of catch-all. If none of the other cases, none of the other cases, cases match, then otherwise it matches. Um, you can also do let bindings. I possibly should have shown this one first. So if you wanted to compute the, uh, you know, the area, the surface area of a cylinder, for example, you give it the radius and the height. I'll bind, I'll name sort of the um, the area that represents the sort of the, the cylindrical surface, and then I'll pick, you know, the top and bottom areas, and then you can use that inside of your name um, for this kind of block. So let, you know, so you have let some bindings that you can use whatever, and then um, and then the expression. And then finally, um, so we've seen this, the pattern matching sort of in the building up of functions just by creating different lines, just by creating different lines uh, to, to, to express your patterns in, in the function definition. You can also sort of open up an explicit match or pattern matching uh, um, expression by, so I could implement head this second way, where I, you know, I first bind the name of the list, or I bind the list to, to name x's, and then I do a case expression on that. And so this is sort of similar. You do the, the patterns go here and then the, the result of um, that match would be the, the right hand side after the mirror. Okay. So you have basically case expression of and then a bunch of patterns with the results. Oh, I think those are all messed up. All right, so um, how would you get the third element on the list now? Not using Using pattern matching. Yeah. So, right. So it's um, underscore underscore x underscore right, and then you know whatever it, if it doesn't match that pattern, then you can go in there. All right. That makes sense. Is that clear? Yes. And it was two underscore three at least. What? And it was two underscore three at least. No. So. Um, they cannot. The thing on the left hand side of the colon is a is a value. The thing on right. the right hand side of the colon is a list. Right. So, so it's like right. everything right. here. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I could have like I could have put like x colon y colon z colon whatever x is and z is and e right if I wanted to. But I didn't need to name I didn't need to name the the uh, the the captures that I'm writing. Sorry. 
So if you only had one underscore in the beginning, yes. um, that would basically say, give me an, any element uh, in the list that has things before it and after it. No. So, okay, so what this is doing, the pad, this is, so this is matter matching from the beginning of the list, all right? So this represents the first element, this is the second, and this is the third. So if I keep putting colons there, it's sort of like, I'm specifying that the list has to be able to at least this length. It doesn't sort of match inside. It doesn't sort of um, match in. in no, it, it makes sense. I, I think what I got hung up on is I thought maybe the your list could have more than three elements, and so that 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 um, underscore on the end was sort of saying, okay, well that represents everything else. It does. So this the list can have more than three elements. Yeah. It has it has to have at least three. Yeah. So this is the third, and then there could be this could represent this represents a list right here. Oh, so that's what you asked In which case, you have three elements in total. There could be any number of other, you know, any other kind of list. Yes. It's hiding a whole lot of parentheses. Yeah, right. Um, and maybe I should have actually put it with a parentheses, actually. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I think I got to throw it out. The underscore on the bottom line, is that just any pattern that hasn't already been matched? Is right, that exactly. That's just saying, so now if for anything else, for any, for, yeah. so that will match, well, it'll, it'll match any any list that is of not at least size three. Right, so this matches anything else. Okay, so you would commonly have that as the last one? Right. Okay. And if you ha didn't have it last, it would eat everything, right? Like yeah, if I put that first, order. I'd always get an error. Okay. All right, so um, very important in functional programming is to, um, is to have sort of higher order functions. So this, these are functions that either can accept functions as arguments or return as, uh, um, return as return values. All right, so, um, so let's get back to the, that strange, silly, uh, goofy syntax uh, for, um, for function definition, right? So let's look at the max function. Max is, for some, you know, for things of the or type class, it takes an A, it takes an A to an A to an A, okay? All right, so um, another way of looking at that, and that's sort of the more precise way of looking at this, so in Haskell, all functions are curry, which means that all functions actually take only one argument, all right? So the proper way to look at the mass function is it's a function that takes an element and returns a function that takes an element. Does that make sense? All right? You don't need these parentheses, but it's because it sort of it sort of associates to the right. Okay, so every function, or every function in Haskell is only a single argument function, which we sometimes don't talk about it that way, but that's that's how it actually works. So all functions are it's called curvy. So you could write, you know, sort of there's the same you max four or five is the same as writing max four or five, which this creates a function. This is obviously a function, right? Partial implied, I guess. And then apply function. All right. So let's talk about partial application. So let's say you had a function that, that uh, you wanted to multiply that, that basically took took three arguments and returned uh, the multi the the, the uh, product of those arguments. Um, I could create a I could partially apply with one element. I could say okay, multiply two numbers with nine by just take, taking mult three and applying nine to it. All right. So now I have a new function that I can give. You know, two arguments do, right? Then I can do it again. Multi oh, that should be that's fine. No, that's right. So I'll multiply a number with 18. So you basically take mult two with nine with another two, right? So this is nine. The nine is from oh, All right. So basically, we, we so now since all functions are since all functions are curry, we can partially apply functions, and the uh, the expression we get out is a new function we can use. All right. Um, and then the thing I wanted to point out here in this comparison is let's say, um, so let's say we wanted to take the compare function and create a compare with one other function, all right? One could write it like this, but Ed would write it like this, all right? Well, it's called point free notation. The idea is, um, you know, compare of 100 is a function that takes one, well, one A and produces a, produces an order, okay? And so you don't need to put the X on both sides. 
So these, these were from mistakes. Is there a way to partially apply a function with, but with not the first argument, but with like you know, the second or the third? Or kind of. Well, so this is kind of an example of that, right? So when you have like a, an infix function, I could I could create a divide by ten by doing slash ten. I can do ten divide by by doing ten divide, right? I don't actually think it works in other cases. There's a flip function yeah, there's, that you can use to yeah. get to the second one, but oh. there's not a general pattern. The lens package has a combinator that you can use to get down to the end of this. Is that a, is that a com so if you use magic, common thing? It. It's not a very common it's, description. It's, okay. Usually, you just write an inline on on those functions and just backslash and then on. Yeah. Yeah. Lambda x and then flip the x where you want. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I, it's a Yeah, you want to you want to put the ones that are going to change the most often yeah. later in your yeah. argument oh, list. I gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And that way people can apply them, you know, partially without having to yeah. play games. Okay. The thing that the type constraints are redundant to is numerics and ordering. No, 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 no. no. There, there are there are there are a number of types that are that are not ordered that you can work with. But you can actually make a function that returns a, a number. It's actually a numeric type. You can add functions and we'll take the argument and pass each function and then add the answers, right? But you can't order the result of a function. <coughs> as an example. Complex numbers. Complex numbers. Well, that's just <laughs> should exist. <laughs> I don't remember exactly everything that num gives you. It's like plus and times. Plus times minus absolute value sigma. So some examples of, so we're learning about higher order functions, let's do some examples. So say you wanted to create a function that would basically, so um, that will take a function and um, apply it twice to an argument, okay? Um, in this case, the parentheses aren't needed because the first argument of this function actually is a function. All right, so if you want to apply plus three twice to the pen, you get 16. Um, and I remember what I said about um, you can do the, um, which for the infix functions, you can put the, the argument that you want and pick the side that you want. Here's an example here. So apply twice a concatenate world to hello and hello world world. But if I do world in front of the concatenation, you get sort of what you'd expect, right? It's, it's flipped, all right? And you can sort of apply your cons, you know, twice. So you can sort of not have to not have to show. So it looks like it would be really hard to write that apply twice function that point three. It's going to be really hard to read off the text. There's a function yeah. named dot that will let you compose functions. You yeah. can say apply twice f equals f dot f. Very cool. I wasn't attacking yet. No. <laughs> no. And, then, and, then, and then there's another function named join that can get rid of the other thing. So it's apply twice equals join dot. And then you get the whole thing done. <laughs> you can get rid of all the arguments. It's actually a, um, um, on the, I'm sorry for the, the, the expression. There's a, um, a Hassel channel on, on IRC.freenode.net that has a bot named LambdaBot, and it has a, 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 a fan, FPL, which stands for pointless, which will randomly remove all, but you can you, you just pass it a, a, a Lambda, and it, it, without even looking at the types, we'll figure out how to get rid of all the arguments. Okay, just syntactically manipulate. It's one of those kind of tricks you pick up after playing with it for a while. And for like, we're talking about one or two arguments, it's sometimes useful, but. And not other than give it lambda a, b, d, e, f, g. Yeah. Join is in control of that Thank you. It will be in clearly in seven times. All right, so um, very famous higher order function called math. <coughs> That basically takes it takes a function from A to B, um, a list of A's, which are the list of B's, right? So if I basically applies the function every element of the list, 
So um, there's one possible implementation of it, um, and then some examples. Most people have probably seen math by now. I think even Java has it. Yep. As a Java. <laughs> And uh, filter, similarly with filter, uh, you know, take, have a, takes a predicate, a list, and sort of filters out the things that, that, that satisfy the predicate. All right, so there's some examples. All right, and then um, you can create anonymous functions. So um, if you wanted to map sort of plus three across the list, you could write it that lane way, um, just for example. But they, so the idea is, you if you want to build a lambda expression, you do the backslash, the arguments, and then the arrow, um, and then the return you create for a function. So it could be a way of creating anonymous functions, basically. Anonymous. Oh. Oh. I should have gone through my talk before, so I'm exposed all my plans. All right. So um, how would you write partitions? This is sort of the function you need for quick sort, right? It takes a list and Splits it into the elements that are smaller or greater, or smaller or less than some some more some element. <laughs> right, so you just filter. Right, you take, um, you bind x and x's, filter the ones less than x, and it's greater than the incorrect. Right, it's one way. It's just for the damn it's a right. slight bump. We wouldn't like people to lose man. Alright, so um so there's also this notion of folds. Folds are useful for when you have some data structure, for example, that you want to traverse once and produce a value. Alright? So um you could fold from the left or from the right. So I have an example here of using both. Uh, you could write sum. This is sum. This is the exact same sum function that I had written earlier, right? I, I wrote it using a full block. So you take you basically take the function plus with a zero with a you know start with a start value, right? I probably should have written the type signature for fold. I didn't. So the type signature for fold is it takes a function. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's fun. It's like function. It's a fold takes. An A to B to, I'm going to get all the numbers right. Basically, it takes a right, function. Fold R is A to B to B. <laughs> right. Fold R is A to B to B. A to B to B, and a B. To B. And a list of A's. And it gives you a B. It gives you a B, right. And the fold left is still there. Yeah, but the numbers are A to B to A. B. Okay. Um, so, can anyone guess? This is actually not a quiz. Um, I should have made it a quiz. Can anybody guess why I use fold left for some and fold right for So you for forgot math, to use because you forgot to use fold L primes. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about a fold L prime in this talk. So, uh, <laughs> don't use fold L. Use fold L prime, and that will fix that so that everybody gets it. No, that's yeah, that's, that's something Duncan wants to do. Not I'm, not, I'm not necessarily a hundred percent on that. Uh, What's so, There's, there's it's a, just there's a, a standard name. function named sum, it's and so he just needed to make something that like that was his own without having to hide the other one and do all this stuff. So he just right. named he just made something that's like sum. Right. Oh, it's not the normal Haskell that you could use in an identifier, but it's yeah. Oh, it's a math Yeah, it, yeah, it, it looks mathy, and so you know it's like it. vision. I know it's the, the brain is it's like a couple slashes inside the vector keeper or something, or but you know if they're using a uh, slash equal instead of a brain. Yeah. Well. Um, it's just because, like, slash, like if you actually look at the notation for not equals, it, like, it looks like, you know, something like, with a slash through it. So, so I thought they were reading the same in the same uh, character. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> well, we, we did use bang, but we, we're, you're allowed to glue together pretty much arbitrary se se sequences of symbols into an operator. So, and you can make up your own operators and stuff. Nowadays. 
All right, so the idea here is fold left um, associates to the left and fold right associates to the right. So um, in this case, fold right in this case, um, notice that, uh, so if I used fold left to, uh, to build map, my list that is sort of, uh, um, my list would have been reversed at the end. I mean, that's obvious to people. If you stare at it long enough, you'll, you'll, you'll probably convince yourself. But if you use fold left to, to build out map, you'll get a sort of reverse list at the end. All right, so um, Ed mentioned this earlier. There's another um, function for function application, I guess. So dollar sign. Well, so space is like, so, okay, so this looks a lot like just space, right? So function after, if you want to call it, if you want to apply x to f, you just do fx, right? So why do we need this extra dollar sign thing? So there's two reasons. Um, dollar sign has sort of low precedence, the low, I get it, the very low precedence in its right associative, and space has the highest precedence in its right and left associative, right? So if you want to write, um, so I sort of wrote to the if you have functions f, g, and z, if you want to apply them to x, you can do f dollar g dollar z f, right? So see dollars in both sort of written on both shows. Whereas f, b, c, f, a, b, c applies a to f and then b and then c. Keep that in mind. So in this case, we're taking z to x and then g to the result. We're starting from the right here and we're starting from the left here. Okay. Why does it matter what you Yeah, there's no right. <coughs> One reason for dollar sign is it's good. It's a good way to get rid of parentheses. Another reason is actually you might want to you might actually want to use it. Like you if you had a list of functions, for example, and you wanted to apply it to some value, you can use it. I don't know if people ever do that. Well, why does it matter which order you apply apply them in? And like on the well, on the left. So okay, in like this case, yeah. F, G, and so there's a little difference here. F, G, and Z in these cases are functions. In this case. In this case, A, B, and C are values. For example, for example. So if you didn't use the dollar sign if on the left if example, you, right? You would try to apply. It wouldn't. It wouldn't compile. Right. You would try to apply F to well, it might. I guess depending on what F, G, but depending on what they exactly were, right? So okay. Um, if F is expecting a simple type, you know, for example, G is a function type, it just won't work. Like it's that kind of thing. Right. I'm going to use it in some examples later as part of most of the reason. All right, so how do you reverse a list using fold? Fold left or fold right? Fold right. Because the map did it that way. Fold right. But you didn't want to reverse the map, right? My head's going to explode. This is a common problem. <laughs> So, it's so one way to write it. Ah, I don't want to. The right one? Or you can write it like that, using the flip function that I mentioned earlier, right? Great. So, um, we snap, we've yet to learn how to build our own data types. Um, so, uh, so we've talked, so, okay. So, we have types and we have value constructors. So. In favorite languages, um, fake langs is a type, and Haskell integers and either are values of that type, just like one, two, and three are values of type integer. Okay? Um, your value constructors can take arguments. Um, so, um, and in which case, they're sort of like, they're sort of very similar to functions, right? They're ways of constructing, um, they're ways of constructing values of a given type, and so they're always functions into that type. Okay? And you can write a function, so then, um, so, so in my example here with asset holding, you would asset, you would use asset holding for a <clears throat> in a type signature, and then you know, so you do pattern matching this to construct this to that type. All right. Yes. Can you explain the thing about how the first letter matters and then the last letter doesn't? Yes, um, kind of. So I guess types and type or in and value constructors have to be cap the first letter has to be capitalized, and I think functions it has to be lowercase. And I'm not sure that sums it up completely and actually. What? Names that you combine are lowercase. So variables are lowercase. Yeah. Whereas um, 
constant portion of stuff that the government would have to like go through. Um, it's all the type like rule that the capital P or capital F um, to make those values. Um, you can't find the name of the proof, but you can do lower case T, you can say let T equal uh, X squared plus 12, and um, you know the name. The, 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 the names you can find, lower case. And type variable. Type variable says the lowercase because you can't get it found. Whereas um, you couldn't have a list of ints and find over ints. Int is a thing, you know, it, it's set, it's settled, it's found in the whole domain. Yeah. All right, so. Um, these data types, the algebraic data types, can be uh, recursively defined. Um, so, um, I fixed this slide after I did it to update it. So, forget this A and forget this thing. We're talking about layers. So, if we want to have a list and okay, so list can either be empty or it can be the, the cons of an element in another list. All right, so. Um, Unfortunately, I, I put some stuff on this slide that weren't our issues yet. All right. So uh, the point here is that you can um, the 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 uh, constructors of a of a type can can sort of recursively depend on itself all the time. All right. All right. So um, types and type classes again. Um, so what does equals type class look like in uh, the prelude looks something like this. I don't know if this is exactly correct, but um, it has two functions, equals and not equals. And then there's actually implementations for both of them. Um, so the idea here is you can implement one or the other if you want, or both. It's, 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 sort of, uh, it's your choice. Um, so if I want to make my favorite languages uh, type an instance of this uh, equals type class, um, this is the syntax, right? So for Haskell equals Haskell is Haskell. Uh, Haskell. Right, and so go ahead and do the implementation. Um, and I did a similar thing for show. Remember, show is a way of turning a type into, a, or a turn a value of a, of a given type into a string. Um, I think if you call it, it'll just yeah, it'll just, it'll spin, just, it'll just spin forever. Yeah, it's just going to not, 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 right. not, not, never. Mila does not check. Can't tell, right? There's a, uh, in 7 there's a minimal thing that, that will at least say that you should supply one or the other and give you a warning. But prior to that, it uh, didn't even give you a warning. So what does it do in reverse the type class? Like, can you if I'm representing my type A and I'm using my type class, but it tells me that they don't have to have, have all the properties in the reference class? Uh, so in order to become an instance, you do have to implement all the operations. It just, I, maybe I'm saying this is not quite precisely. Uh -huh. Equals, so the equals type class, both of the functions are, are, are implemented for you. I mean, right. they're mutually recursive. <laughs> you should supply one of them. Right. Uh, I mean, and whenever it, you supply overrides, they default one. Yes. <laughs> um, so for a lot of the sort of built-in types, and I think even more than that, the compiler can actually derive a lot of these these, uh, these instances for you. So um, if you sort of want this simple, you know, uh, equals type class, for example, you can do this deriving thing that I accidentally showed earlier, right? So so this so you know. GHC can say can implement equal DVP type class instances for equals original show, blah, 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 blah. All right, there's a bunch of them you can do. Um, I think there's an extension where you can do even more. Maybe more um, all right, so we have a data type called maybe. I said we would talk about this. Um, so I said earlier we have types. We have types and value constructors, but we also have our type constructors too. 
So maybe it's what's called a type constructor. It needs another type in order to um, produce, a, produce a type. So the way you would define maybe is data maybe of some type is either nothing or just a value of that type. All right? So how do we use it? Um, let's just look at the, just, just look at, play around with it in GHC. You know, so just of a string or whatever. Um, the type of just awesome is maybe of list of pair of cars, right? The type of just 42 is a list of some numeric type. It's actually not specified. And then the type of nothing is whatever. It's maybe, any maybe type, right? And maybe of anything, all right? So um, how would we implement the equals type class for maybe? This is actually a little bit tricky. Um, so if you start writing this, you'll notice, um, so first, remember I said maybe is not a type, right? So you can't say um, equals is received. So if you want to implement the equals type class for maybe, right? Equals is expecting a type A. Maybe is not a type, it's a type constructor. Right? What? I'm not gonna, there, there's it's, a slight quibble on the <laughs> terminology. It's, a, it's isn't a type of kind of star. You know, oh, okay, sure, all right. Okay, so the next type. So let's give it a give it a give it the right kind. All right. Oh, uh, there's still a problem with this. Can anybody see the, the problem with my implementation? <coughs> the problem. What? Yes, exactly. Because you're using equals on x and y of type m, right? So you need to specify that m is in the All right, so um, we still haven't written Hello World, so let's talk about I.O. a little bit. Um, so, right, Haskell is a pure functional language, which means you, which, um, side effect free language, all right? So, what does that mean? Well, first, let's start with Hello World. Um, not that impressive, all right? So, let's look at the types now. So, what is the actual type of main? It's something called I.O. of... Uh, it's called unit, um, the open and close um, parentheses is called unit. All right, so main is what's called an I.O. action of unit, all right? Print line, print str line takes a string and returns a I.O. of unit, all right? So all the types line up, all right? Go on. All right, so let's write a little simple function to, let's write a little echo function, right? Okay, so um, there's this... Uh, we want to chain uh, well, any monadic actions together. We're talking about I. We're just talking about IO now. So when you want to chain IO actions together, there's a sort of special syntax called do, um, where you can basically write a bunch of things that are IO actions in, in sort of a sequence. So print sterlin takes a right print sum to this string. There's this there's other function get line, which is a IO of string. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then you want to basically print out, you know, what the person just said, okay? So you notice this silly, or this, uh, this strange syntax is this left, or this left-hand arrow, answer, <coughs> left arrow, get line. So what's happening here, conceptually, is that um, I want to use, a, I need a string here. For concatenations, I need a string, right? So I can't do, I'm also interested in get line because, um, can't concatenate a string with an IO of a string, right? So this this left hand arrow syntax basically pulls this pulls the string out of the IO container, so you can and find you can bind it to a name. All right, does that make sense? Kind of. All right. If you like uh, if you like uh, printf debugging and don't want to throw the inside IO on it, there's a, a debug and a trace. Or utilizing this, those trace messages that may happen whenever, yeah. the, whenever the hell they damn well please. Yeah, they might not, the, the order might not make the, the, the sense you would intuitively think of use as printf anyway. All right, so I thought I said Haskell couldn't have side effects. Looks like we're, uh, we have these functions that are sort of interacting with the outside world. Trace lines. <laughs> well, trace does. Um, print sterling don't. So what we're actually doing here, and I'm not going to go into all the details, I don't. 
have a great app community. I understand it conceptually. So something like put store line or get line or action, what's, they're not actually doing anything. What they're creating is called an IO action that when handed to the, the GHC runtime will perform that action for you. So um, these are pure functions. And uh, actually, Paul and Runer, I, there's, their book has a good explanation of this. Um, but I'm not going to repeat right now because we're running out of time. Um, but let's go ahead and modify our um, Go to the next. Let's go to the next step. So, um, if you want to include sort of bindings inside of your do notation that are just sort of that are not within the I/O container, you can use a, you can use a let binding. So, in this case, I wanted to sort of you know write a function that will so that we would type in something and it capitalizes where you know, it returns the, the capitalized version of what it did. So, um, just to show let bindings, I I took um, I took the input from the user. And then I mapped the two upper functions, you know, uppercase and all the characters uh, across that line, and then bound it to caps, and then I put star line to caps. So the, the bottom two lines there are the same step in the, the like well, outside state didn't change between the let and the right. See, I couldn't have said like caps equals left arrow map to upper line because this is a pure function, right? Not wrapped in an I/O, not wrapped in an I/O. Not wrapped in IO. Not wrapped in IO. Okay. So um, I just want to I just want to give it a name so you can use let for that. Um, this all gets sort of desugared into something more <coughs> complicated, or different, I guess. Maybe not more complicated. All right. So for the last example, um, now we want to um, write it better. So we want to you know we want to keep doing this right until the user you know, gets us an empty line. So, um, give me a, you know, give me a, something to capitalize, empty line quits, I read the line from input, if the line, null is a function that um, checks if the list is empty, right, so if line is lit, like a, a string is a list of characters, so if line is empty, then basically return, this is not the, this is not the sort of uh, you know the normal imperative programming return. This is just a function, right? So um, this is a way of wrapping unit inside of an I/O action. So return of unit return is uh, produces under the value I/O of the unit. All right. Um, it's actually more general than that, but we're keeping it here for now. Else, um, I didn't do the let binding in this case. Else, I put store line the map of two upper line, right? And then I basically recursively call main, right? The, the, the return type of main is well, is return, so I can do that. All right. Um, and notice I am, I opened up another do block right there, and that's because the right else is expecting a single expression, right? So um, I can't put sort of two. There's other ways to write it, but you know, do basically convert takes a takes a list of or it takes a takes a Take some IO actions and then it converts them to a single expression. So this is one way to think about it. And 